Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for joining us here on our YouTube channel for episode number 1029. Well, today we're going to talk kind of about a niche farming operation. It's something that is getting more and more popular, but it's still emerging, and that is raising and selling show goats, marketing them all over the nation And also using embryo transfers to really grow those good genetics and those good quality livestock into your herd as quickly as you can. Today coming on the show is Jacob Ebers from Ebers Twisted E Show Goats in South Dakota. Very, very interesting description of this business and this niche that I think can help you to develop a very sustainable farming operation in your particular region of the country. And uh, we are going to get that started for you right now. Jacob, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, you bet. How is uh, how South Dakota treating you today? Well, it's white outside. <laughs> um, we just uh, we just had another big snowstorm here this weekend. We probably had more snow in the last three weeks than we did the rest of the winter. So we got we got off pretty lucky um, for the year we just had. But uh, get a bunch of time of year it leaps quick, and we're just waiting for the mud now. I suppose. Yeah, the mud season's coming. Are you guys kidding right now? Um, we are. We're just about done. Um, got about a half dozen left in the barn to go that are due here in the next month. Otherwise, um, majority of our stuff we we get out in December and January. Okay. A few tricklers in February. So. But you do it all indoors. Yeah. Yep. Everything's done inside. Um, got a uh, just a big big shed. We got spray foam and so that we built it just for just a kid barn. I mean that's all okay. it's used for. Um, but yeah, everything inside. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Yeah. I was watching the forecast and we're recording this about a week before it's coming out, but I was watching the forecast, seeing what was coming through Colorado, then you guys, and that was a lot of snow. Yeah. I don't know. I suppose we got eight, eight inches at our place. Okay. comes in that south wind though. No one, no one in South Dakota set up for a south wind. So it's, there's drifts everywhere. But that's uh, right. Okay. All right. Well, let's do this. I'd, I'd love to just get you introduced to our audience. I kind of did that in the introduction just a little bit, but if you would, just tell us a little bit about you and your family and what it is you do. Yeah, you bet. Um, so my name is Jake, like I said. Uh, my, my wife, Sarah, and I, um, we got two little boys. Um, Easton's going to be five here in about three weeks, and then Lawson will be one in about three and a half weeks. Um, we started raising show goats here back in 2016. Um, uh, Ask me why. I'm not even sure. I, I, I grew up showing lambs. Um, my wife comes from a Richard Angus farm, showed pigs and cattle growing up. Um, kind of decided we wanted to do something, and, and the goat deal intrigued both of us. Uh, it's definitely getting more popular up here. You get down south and over east, it's it's a, a much bigger deal. But even in the last four or five years in the state of South Dakota where I'm from, um, I mean, the number of goats and families that are getting into it is just compound exponentially. So, well, yeah, we started back in 16, went, uh, drove to Texas with a buddy who raised a bunch of club lambs and, and came back with 11 does and a, and a buck and um, kind of thought to myself, hey, maybe in five, six years, I'll be up to 15 of them. And uh, there's a few more than that floating <laughs> yeah. around here now. So it, it's one of those deals that started as a kind of little hobby is, is kind of compounded from there, I guess. Interesting. So were you and your wife, were you involved in, in any sort of agricultural venture before you before you got the goats? Growing up or, or just right when we started this? Well, so I know you were growing up, but um, what I mean is this your first venture is, I guess, as a married couple in, into ag. Oh, I get what you're saying. Um, yes and no. So my wife's a nurse. She's a registered nurse. Um, I actually work for, uh, for an egg company. I work for a, a seed company. I um, sell corn and soybeans, work with a bunch of retailers in the state, mm-hmm. South Dakota, North Dakota. So involved in, in the agronomy side of it, I guess, but um, the animal agriculture, my family and her family both still raise a bunch of cattle. So we help out at, at both farms a little bit, but nothing to the extent that we're doing now, I guess it was more, uh, need help working calves or something like that. We'd be around, but, um, nothing full time, I guess, besides just our day jobs. Okay. All right. Who do you sell seeds for? I work for Northrop King NK seeds. Okay. So okay. based out of, um, I guess I'm based on Northern South Dakota and cover up the Northern third of the state and a little bit of North Dakota. Okay. Very cool. Okay. So this was, uh, this was kind of your guys's venture into your own agricultural entity then. Yep. yep. Okay. And then, um, the name, uh, twisted E is that, is that come off of a family brand or what does that stand for? 
No, I mean, it just, I, I give my credit to my wife on it. I think she's the one that thought about it, but uh, wanted something different than just our name. And, and, you know, so it, it, it went in there with the, with the, the last name initial and the first name of our kid Easton. So just okay. uh, had a little ring to it, I guess. And here we are. Okay. Very good. Now I, I raise goats on my farm in Idaho as well. We have cattle, but we, we do multi-species grazing. We have goats as well. And I have kind of, I tell people the same thing as you just said, is I kind of got into them by accident. I really got into them by accident, although they've grown on me. I will tell you that, but uh, you kind of said the same thing. So explain to me what you mean by that. Well, we decided, you know, we're out of college quite a few years and, and want to do something. We have, we live on a 20 acre acreage and, and wanted to get into some type of agriculture and, and just size wise, it wasn't going to, wasn't going to be cattle here. Uh, she grew up with pigs. I, I'm not a big hog guy. Uh, my best friend raises club lambs, a, a, a pile of them and sells them around the country. And so we kind of talked about doing that with him a little bit. And, and it kind of came down to it as we wanted to do something for ourselves. Um, and, and the goat deal just kind of happened. Um, you know, it's a small enough animal where my wife can handle them by herself. She does a lot of the, the day-to-day stuff as well. Um, and then, like I said, just, it was something new and, and growing up here and, and big in other parts of the, the country and, um, just kind of, you know, process of elimination led us to them, I guess. Okay. And you began in 2016. Yep. 16, I believe, I think 4th of July, we took off okay. and, uh, drove to Texas and picked up our first load, I guess. Okay. All right. So. When you, when you started out, when you went to Texas and, and you had this all arranged and you're heading down there to get the goats, what business did you have in mind? Like what type of goat business? Was it all about uh, raising stock for, for shows, for jackpots and fairs and things like that? Yeah. Yep. I mean, the, the whole idea was um, we're, we're going to raise show stock. Um, grew up showing lambs. She grew up, like I said, growing, showing pigs and cattle. Love the 4-H business. Love the FFA. I mean, I just, just the, everything around it. I, I really enjoy, um, you know, having a couple kids. It's, I mean, that's what they're going to grow up doing. So, um, you know, we've, we've definitely ventured off. We're doing some commercial stuff as well now, but it, it started as, Hey, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to run a, a huge number of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're going to raise as good a stock as we can. Okay. Um, and, and kind of progress from there. Okay. And, kind of what drew me or what helped me find you, there was an article in Ag Week about you and it was yep. talking about doing embryo transfers. So was that the plan at the outset or is that something that evolved over time? Yeah. I mean, I think we kind of think here, if we flushed our very first year or it might've been our second year. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was always the idea behind it is, I mean, it's just a numbers game, right? Um, you know, people think we're crazy on what we spend on some of our breeding stock. I mean, I, my, my first load of does from Texas cost more than Brett Heffers did. So, wow. you know, it's, it's one of those deals. You can't go buy a hundred of them. Um, and the, the flush deal is a, a quick way to, um, you know, take your, your good or your best does or even your, mm-hmm. your ones that are making solid babies. And, and instead of having say 30 does there, you can do what we did with 10 and flush half of them and, and you can get your numbers there real quick. Um, yeah, obviously you still need the recip does and, yeah. and that's actually our, we kind of started raising those on the side a little bit too, because that's probably our biggest, the hardest thing to do is find, you know, the good surrogates. Okay. Yeah. The good recepts. So this is interesting to me. So I've done well over a thousand interviews on this show and I think you're going to be the second, maybe th- I think you're going to be the third interview that I've ever talked to who is doing embryo transfers in goats. And as far as I can tell, um, the practice of embryo transfers in goats is emerging still. Would you describe it that way? Yeah. I mean, I think it's been, it's been done for a while, but not at the level of what the cattle guys or the sheep guys are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you look into some of the big, big producers, I mean, there's, there's guys flushing, you know, especially on Texas, there's probably guys flushing two, 300 does a year. I mean, we're nowhere near that. Okay. Um, but it's definitely getting more and more. I mean, I think up here, not saying we're the first ones by any stretch because we're not, but there's not as many at the further North you get. I don't think there's as many as it is down South. There's some of the the more populated goat States, Uh same thing with AI. And I mean, that's becoming a bigger and bigger deal too. Um, But I, I, yeah, I I, compared to the other breeds, I definitely say it's, it's much newer than, you know, than the sheep and cattle industries would be for sure. Yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, obviously Texas, that is the number one goat state we have in the whole country 
would you describe South Dakota as a goat state? Oh, probably not. No. I mean, I think South Dakota is probably club calf capital of the world. Right. I mean, I think if you, if people actually knew how many of the, the calves that won these majors actually came from a pasture in the state of South Dakota, it'd probably shock a lot of guys. Mm. Um, but I mean, we're a cattle state first for sure. Um, we have some, some big time cattle breeders and we have a few big time sheep breeders in the state too, pigs mm-hmm. as well. Um, I still think we're probably shooting, you know, fourth in the, in the totem pole of, of, of breeze in the state, but I think we're, we're making a run for it. There's a, there's quite a few breeders in the state and some pretty progressive ones now too. So when, when you guys started this and you decided to start flushing and doing embryo transfers, then with, with South Dakota, not being what you would call a goat state, was it difficult to find, uh, I guess, veterinarians or, or people with the, the technological expertise to help you get this job done? Yeah. So, I mean, we've, we've had, let me think here, one, two, four different people do flushes for us now. Now the last three years or four years, we've had the same crew. They come out of Kansas, uh, Reaper Logics do an awesome job for us. Okay. Um, but that's, that's almost everybody they're traveling, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely people that do it, but, but not a ton locally. Um, you know, it's, it's guys, the, the guys that we have flushed, they have a big trailer and they come back up right to the barn and, and it's a, it's a mobile unit. We're not hauling nothing. We have, hauled to a couple different places and done it. Um, <clears throat> but it's sure nice when they just come right to my place, everything's set up and, and ready to roll. But yeah, locally, there's not a, not a ton of guys around here that are set up to do it, I guess. Gotcha. But somebody's made a business, somebody's filled the niche and they're traveling and getting it done. Yep. Okay. So I, I'm just intrigued in this because where I'm at in Idaho, you know, we've just in the last couple of years at our fair, we've seen um, our sheep and goat barn uh, it's almost flip flopped from, it used to be dominated by sheep. Now it's getting dominated by goats. And I think that's happening all over. And I think you kind of stated all the reasons that's happening as well. They're easy to work with. Um, and people like them. Uh, there's no question yep. about that. And so you see these businesses emerging, you see embryo transfers and things like that becoming more and more common. Um, I'm seeing, uh, sheep breeders who are known around our area for breeding sheep. They're now also breeding goats and now they've got a line of goats. I mean, they're right on top of it. Um, yep. Now for you, when you're going to have this crew show up to do this flushing, obviously you've got to have everybody synced. You've got to have everything in place uh, when that happens. So is that, is that, I don't know, is it the same process as syncing up cattle and, and getting everything ready to go? Yeah. I'm, I guess I've never, I've never set a, set a cap up, I guess, but I'm, it's gotta be pretty similar, right? So we're, you know, on the recip side, there's cedars that go in. There's a couple rounds of shots to get all the, the recips all synced up because we're going to throw a fertilized egg in them. And then you have the donors. I mean, it's a.m. and p.m. shots for four or five days mm-hmm. of breeding. And it's when they say shots are at 7 a.m., it's shots are at 7 a.m. It's not 7.05. It's not 7.15. It's not 6.45. It's it's 7 a.m. I mean, the, the more I mean, these guys that are, are doing it, the crew we have or other guys, I mean, they've everyone's got their own protocol and they spend a lot of time and money developing them. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty important to, to follow those instructions to a T or we try to at least, mm-hmm. right. I mean, well, at my place, we run whatever donor gets her shot first, that first day, she gets her shot first, the second day. I mean, they, okay. they go through the shoot in the exact same order every time. And um, yeah, I mean, it's the, the week before when we're getting, um, you know, synced up in the breeding, that's, that's pretty crucial. And, stressful i guess but <laughs> yeah it's worth it well it's interesting to me because cattle of course are polyesterous and so you know they're coming into heat every you know every month uh yep. and goats are supposed to be seasonal breeders although you can get two litters out of them a year sometimes you know it kind of it kind of yep. moves back and forth how does that impact this business are you are you flushing more than one time per year are you implanting more than one time per year uh right now we're not um we're doing just once and we're, well, we, we would be off season, I guess, if you wanted to call it, I mean, we're usually flushing in July. Um, and, and that's probably where the, probably the most crucial part about the shots, right. Is we're, we're trying to get these things to breed when they don't want to. And, yeah. you know, instead of throwing two eggs, we want to throw 20 eggs. Um, so it is a hit or miss. I mean, we have, we, we've had some donors that, you know, but we flush out, two embryos, they, they, they don't stimulate the drugs. They don't take, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, we've looked into the flush and multiple times a year as we progress and we've, we're, we're getting to the point where we're about maxed out at capacity on, on our facility. So we're looking at, you know, whether we're going to start doing some fall borns or some spring borns or okay. flushing off 
gear and freezing embryos. Um, that way, you know, if you have one that doesn't, you know, flush doesn't work as well, you got some in the tank. We have some in the tank from last year that will, we had a great flush last year and made way more than we had recent score. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we're not twice a year, I guess we're, we're just once a year and we have a pretty tight window where we want to have our babies just where our market is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, earlier I was saying that, you know, I felt like this was emerging the embryo transfer. Um, you're saying, well, people have been doing it for a while so that it's not new necessarily, but it may be the, uh, the proclivity of people doing this. Uh, that's going up. Is that all being driven uh, by, I guess, this new interest or this growing interest in showing goats? I think so. I mean, and the more popular goats have become, the more people want good ones, right? Yeah. Um, the world is will never make enough good good animals, right? There'll never be enough good livestock for everybody to have have the one to win every single year. Right. So, as a breeder, I mean, I want to stick as many good animals in my barn for my customers as possible. Um, now, not every family wants you know, it all depends on their goal. Not every family's goal is to win the state fair either. Mm -hmm. Um, but I want to make sure the families that come through my barn, that that's what they want to do, that I have, I'm giving them the best opportunity to do it. And the way I can do that is, is taking my best does, right. And getting as many babies out of them as I can. Um, and, and let the chips fall where they may, I guess. What, uh, what percentage of the, the kids do you get on the ground do you pull and say, nah, I'm not going to sell those, uh, for, for breeding or for, uh, showing. You mean like which ones I'm keeping back? Yeah. For or my one, own use or well, what I'm, and... what I'm thinking of is I, I'm assuming that not every, not every kid that hits the ground you're looking at and going, that's a winner or that's the quality we want to sell. And so I'm wondering, you know, is, is, is because I'm doing this interview because other people are going to be yep. interested in this. They want to know how to develop this business they're going to be wondering, you know, what percentage of these am I going to be able to sell as show quality goats? And then what percentage roughly, uh, are going to have to go down the road to a different route? You know, it probably depends on the year. Right. Um, but <clears throat> you know, I'd be a hard pressed to find a, a true percentage. I mean, maybe 5%, 10%. Okay. But I mean, that being said, like I was saying is everybody has a different, um, end game, right? There, there's some of those families that, Hey, I just want a, a, an animal to, my kid needs the chores. We want the experience. We want to get into it. We don't want to spend big dollars. We can, we can find that animal just as well as we can as find the one that the guy wants to go out and, and swing for the banner too. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I don't have two families that want to do the same thing. Okay. Um, so the flush side of it helps on that. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, just cause I flush a donor and say we get eight babies out of one dough, it doesn't mean those eight babies all look the same either. Right. I just like me and my sister don't look alike. Right. I mean, it's <laughs> kind of one of those deals where, um, you know, they don't always hit like that, but I think there's, there's a family for every goat. I mean, there's definitely those ones that come out and yep, they're, you know, they're going to the sale barn or we're going to fatten them out and butcher them or, or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Or, but, um, for the most part, I mean, there's a family that, that's interested in most of them. Okay. Well, that's kind of the reason I'm asking is I'm, I'm wondering what, I guess your other line of revenue on your goats is like in South Dakota in terms of prices for meat goats where I'm at, I'm near Boise, Idaho and our price for meat goats is just through the roof. It's just unbelievable. Um, matter of fact, I stopped selling them direct. Now I just take them to the auction because you get the bidding war going on in the auction. You get better prices, honestly. Um, are you, are you experiencing the same thing on the meat goat side on, in South Dakota? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we're kind of out of it, you know, cause we're, that's not our end game right. by any stretch of imagination. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, we took some, some cold does in here, um, you know, a month or so, a month or so ago and the price we got, I mean, blew my mind. So then you start looking cause I just haven't paid attention. Yeah. I get uh -huh. over four or four, 10 a pound for, you know, for feeder size or, or kill weight goats and it it has gone through the roof. Um, and that's kind of the reason we've kind of ventured off and, and run a commercial herd too on the side to try and make our own recips. Cause unfortunately when, you know, when a kill nanny is worth three and a half, 350 bucks, a good recips worth $400. Sure. And you know, that's also the side of it too on the revenue income, I guess. Man, your prices for meat goats are higher than ours. And I thought ours were through the roof. My goodness. Yep. Yeah, I've done the math. I mean, we, we raise beef on my place and we direct market them and we get a premium direct marketing them that way, but I can get as much or more per pound 
uh, just taking a goat into the auction after it's been alive for six, seven months. And yep. so I've toyed with the idea like, well, if this was purely a business decision, I'd go 100% goats because that would be a much simpler business and I would do just as well or better with almost a guaranteed market. Uh, so it's it's really interesting to look at, uh, but it sounds like, uh, shoot, I thought we were ahead of the curve. It sounds like we're still coming up. Uh, our prices are yet to catch up to you guys. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. And I think it's all cyclical, right? I think, you know, with, with COVID and the stuff that happened, I mean, there's just not the, the numbers out there right now. Mm -hmm. um, supply and demand, right now there's demand for it and there's not supply to fill it. So that, that just raises the cost of everything. I mean, that's that's way more than we've ever sold one for, right? Um, a mm -hmm. lot of times when you get two and a half bucks, you're still tickled pink though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, some of the prices right now, you wish you had a whole bunch of them on the ground that could go. Well, let's talk about growing your business. So uh, we kind of talked about the the nuts and bolts of it, the genetics and 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 the the flushing and all of that. But let's talk about growing a brand, growing you know, growing the name Ebers Twisted E Show Goats. How many how many different states are you selling into now, or are you keeping it all right there in in your region? Oh no, we're yeah, we're all over the place. Um, I'm trying to think here, where have we sold in the past? And we've South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa. Wisconsin, um, Indiana, we sold to Ohio, we've sold to Pennsylvania, um, North Carolina. Um, I know I'm in Missouri. I know I got a family from Missouri. So yeah, it's, it's kind of all over. Um, you know, we've been really lucky being in it a pretty short time. We've, we've, um, got to work with some extraordinary families, good people, um, from all over the country. So we've been pretty lucky that way. That is great. How how long did it take to get there to where you were selling goats way far outside of South Dakota? Honestly, the first year that we um, we sold, we we go to a big sale. We're actually going out here in two weeks to Indianapolis, Midwest Steel Eating Premier Ten sale. Uh, Willoughby puts that on every year. So our very first year that we had kids on the ground, we went out there with with three head, and I think they went to Kansas, Pennsylvania, and and Ohio. I believe was the the first three that we we ever sold, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, one of those families we're still doing business with today and, um, you know, the world of, of sales anymore. I mean, whether it's, we go out there, it's a live sale. Um, we've had a live sale in Sioux Falls in the past where it's also telecast online and then online sales. It's, you know, we, you love to sell them as close at home as you can. So you can keep an eye and help out, but somebody in Florida or North Carolina or California can get online and, and see those things and decide they like it too. And, and the next thing you know, they're, they're out of there. So, um, we definitely, I mean, the majority of our animals probably still do stay in, in state. Mm -hmm. Um, but they are, you know, every year we, we venture a little bit further out and further out too. So. Okay. And so you've been heading out to that sale in Indianapolis every year, every year since you got your first kids ready to sell. Uh, yeah, I believe this will be our fourth year, fourth or fifth year going out there now. Okay. Um, you know, and we've, we've taken as few, a few as three head. Uh, I think we took as, as many as 10 year, one year out there. So, um, you know, it's a, a pretty cool sale. You meet people from all over the country and then obviously breeders from all over the country too. So pretty good networking, um, trip too, but. And is there a show associated with that sale or is it just a straight sale? Yeah, no, on the, the, there is a, so it's a big sheep and goat, goat show and sale. So the Saturday deal, there's a show on Friday and, um, you know, readers show their own goats, not, not like kids are doing it or anything, but, mm -hmm. um, you show them, they judge them and that, that kind of sets a sale order for the next day. And then okay. it's a live sale and it's online as well, but in-person sale then on Saturday. Okay. That is super interesting to me because of one of the aspects you mentioned. So you, you went that first year, you sold those three, uh, those three goats at the sale. And then after that, uh, you had customers that you developed, you're doing repeat business with over time. And so it's a, it's a place to market your animal, but it's also a place to market your business and to grow those, I guess, almost lifelong, uh, business type relationships. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. Okay. What, uh, what other kinds of marketing do you do? You know, we're probably, probably not at the forefront of that. Like, like some are, but, um, you know, we use social media as much as possible, Facebook, um, with, with the development of that, I mean, you can reach a lot of people in a short amount of time I and mean, we've done some newspaper stuff in the past, but it just doesn't seem like you're hitting quite the people demographic as you can online. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's, that's kind of mainly how we've gotten out there to, you know, people that aren't local, right. I mean, we'll do some flyers and some ads and 
and send stuff out to current customers, remind them of sale dates and stuff like that. But, you know, honestly, word of mouth has probably been our, our biggest piece of advertising. I mean, I get phone calls and, and text messages and messages on Facebook from, hey, I talked to, you know, so-and-so, they liked working with you, we like their animals, we're looking at showing goats next year, can we come and, and, and see them or, you know, we want to buy them from you this year. And that's probably been the biggest thing is, you know, the families that we have that are, you know, good friends and have become, become even better friends that, mm-hmm. that help us out too by, you know, promoting our business to, to I guess, their competition, right? I mean, if one of my families buying a goat and they tell somebody else can buy a goat, that's, they're going to compete against them. But right. um, it, that's the probably, the probably the biggest thing that's helped us is, is just word of mouth, probably. Interesting. Okay. Now, when it comes to your kidding dates, I mean, obviously with you getting out in all these different states in terms of shows and then fairs, um, that's all over the map in terms of, yep. of when these goats are going to be shown. So how do you choose when to kid? Well, that's, that's an ongoing conversation in our household. I can promise you that. Um, so we've been mainly December and January. So that hits the Midwest fairs. And then as you go east, um, you know, we're probably not hitting the, you know, the California and Western markets that, you know, have some of the later fairs in Texas. Um, but, you know, all over the country, there's there's shows, you know, Houston, Fort Worth. I mean, some of these big, you know, Texas majors, OIE, stuff like that's going on right now. just got done. Um, see, you know, we're, we're up here where we're, we're not going to kid you around. So we're not going to have one for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but the size of goat that we're making, you know, we can hit those early fairs, something like Wisconsin, North Dakota have like July state fairs. Some of our early stuff can hit them. And then even, even places that have later fairs, if our animals are big, you know, there's, there's a lot of States that, Hey, they'll buy two, three jackpot goats. And that's going to be their goat. They drag around all summer long and they jackpot all weekend long and they'll find another one for their state fair. But, um, we've kind of stuck around there cause you know, those are the size that work best for up here from what we found, I guess, or what works for us. And then just timing wise with, um, you know, the holiday season there, you get a little extra time off and, and it's easier to get a whole bunch of goats in a short amount of time and, mm-hmm. and then, uh, you know, relax the rest of the year a little bit, I guess. <laughs> okay. So what's ideal, uh, in terms of if you're trying to reverse engineer this, you've got a fair coming up, uh, say it's in July. Uh, when do you want those kids born? What's ideal? Well, it all depends on how big they want them, right? So, um, you know, you're going to have a lightweight, middleweight, and heavyweight out there. seems like a lot of stuff we make for those. You know, our safe area in South Dakota, for example, is in September, right? Um, if, if you're buying a go from us, you're going to play in the middleweights and the heavyweights. We're not going to have a lightweight goat. Um, you know, just we're kidding early enough where we're putting some size and some growth into those animals. Um, and everybody has a different preference, right? Everybody wants, it all depends on where you want to finish your animal at, you know, say for a July fair, a lot of those goats can be born in December. Um, okay. there are some guys doing some October and November born fall borns now too, that'll fit that, that bill. Um, but it depends on the genetics, the growth, you know, rate of gain, you know, there's some genetics that, you know, you can put the pounds on really, really fast. And then there's other genetics that, Hey, they're going to be a little slow feeder and they're not going to be ready until so-and-so time. So there's some predictability goes into it. I mean, we try and keep pretty good records of, Hey, this doe had this kid and this is where it finished out at this time. And so that way when I go look back and family comes and that's for a perfect example, say their fairs in, in July and they want one that's going to be 85 pounds. Well, you know, consistently these are the does or this is the sire group. That's probably going to get you there. Okay. Interesting. And when you're doing, when you're doing the embryo transfers, are you, are you still getting twins? Are you getting triples? How does that work? Yeah. So we'll stick, we stick two in every recip. Okay. So um, if we get an odd number at the end, we'll stick in three. If we're short on recips or stick in one, um, you know, I, I would, I'd rather have one kid on a doe than I would, uh, than I would three. Um, when you get three on one, unless she's just an absolute perfect mother, I mean, one or two of those is going to struggle and just yeah. not get to its potential. So, you know, the, the numbers are great, but, if they're the wrong numbers and they don't get there, then it doesn't matter how many of them you got. So we stick two in every single one. Doesn't mean both of them stick either. I mean, it's not an all or nothing deal. So we'll stick two of them in, in every recip and half of them may only have one. Um, and then the other half will have two, I guess. But yeah, I, I'm not a fan of triplets, squads. Uh, those things get grafted off. We did a lot of grafting this year. Okay. That's just 
nothing we're shooting for, I guess. Okay. And then when it comes to, when it comes to producing the embryos, is it all AI for you? No, honestly, we're last year would have been the first year that we AI any of our donors. Okay. Uh, second year, sorry. Um, and not, and we didn't do all of them. I personally, I like to buck breed them. I'd like to have my buck stand there, breed my donors and, and, and go that route. Um, you know, AI is a surgical, surgical procedure, so you're you're knocking those animals down one or two more times, depending on if you're lap AI in or splash AI in. Um, that just every time you put something down, it's got a chance of something going wrong and mm-hmm. scar tissue and stuff like that. So I haven't done a lot. Um, we're looking at doing this year. Um, we're actually going to do some IVF this year for the first time. Um, so that'll all be, you know, using semen, but obviously on the back side, not the front side of it. So um that'll be something new for us and, and, uh, give that a shot, but. Okay, man, there's a lot I don't know about AI and goats. Uh, plenty I know about AI and cattle, but what you've just described, I'm sitting there and going, well, I need a new education on this. So <laughs> <laughs> you're at, you're anest- that you're, you're putting a goat out before you AI it. Yeah. So there are some guys that'll, that'll, you know, splash AI them and, and, and do it just like a calf or just okay. like a cow. Um, but a lot of it's done laparoscopically. So you're flipping mm. them on their back on a table, flipping them upside down and yeah, they're, they're putting them under a little bit and then, you know, they go in, um, kind of right through the stomach there and put two small holes in there and they'll go in with a, well, a camera and a, you know, your AI gun, I guess wow. that's what their terminology is. And they're, they're inserting that semen, you know, straight into the cervix there and, and getting as close as they can. So, wow. okay. So obviously that's a bit more complicated than, than cattle. Yep. yep. Wow. Okay. Super interesting. Wow. Okay. So how, so with you doing mostly buck breeding, then how often are you rotating through bucks? How often are you changing out bucks? So like on the donors you're saying when we're doing yeah. the, mm-hmm. the flush. So when we set those does up, there's about a 24 hour window there when they're, when they're hot, right. When they're going to, going to, going to take it. Um, so we'll, depending on how many we're flushing to each buck, we'll run a buck. If we're going to say run one buck on, on two donors, um, we'll pen breed them all. So they're in small pens. We'll bring the donor to the buck or the buck to the donor. We'll sit there and watch a breed and we'll pull them out right away. Give them an hour, let them have the, the other donor and then they'll wait four or five hours. But we'll try and in, in a 24 hour period, I mean, we'll try and get them to cover them four times. Okay. Um, and see what happens and then how long is a buck staying on your farm oh it all depends on the buck see how good it is right okay. and what what it's doing um you know we've done a lot of leasing the last couple of years where okay. we're, we're going down to the guy we got our buck our original goat does from and we bought more from the past and been leasing a couple every year and then you know we're putting this one on those no kids and back and forth um we made a couple last year we got we're we're shopping for one right now it, it all depends on the quality, right? And, and if they're going to make me good, solid, sellable kids, then then they can earn their place in the farm. But if you know, everything doesn't always work, right? You can have mm-hmm. one that just genetics don't quite line up, isn't quite what we need, and but that doesn't mean they're not a good animal and they don't work for somebody else. So we'll find a new home for them, I guess. But okay. And then in terms of marketing, I mean, we've kind of talked about Facebook. We talked about the sales you go to. Uh, but for South Dakota, for people who are more local, are you putting on a sale and bringing people to your, to your place or is it all one customer at a time, private treaty type deal? So before last year, when the world got turned upside down, right. Um, we were, we were having a big live sale down in Sioux Falls, um, with my buddy who's a sheep breeder and another, Mm -hmm. um, goat breeder in the state where it'd be, you know, I'd. I'd bring 15 or 20 of them. The other goat guy would bring the same and then I'd bring 50 lambs and it was, it was a live sale and we're rolling one after another. Um, last year we did different. We did our first true online sale with a couple of breeders and then we sold almost everything just strictly out of the barn last year. We did do a little bid off bid board type deal on, on a handful of them. Um, you know, what I guess we're planning on doing this year is, is we got a few online sales that, we're going to roll some doe kits through there and, and then open the barn up and, and probably do another bid board type deal on some weathers. And once we get the, you know, we'll also have some, Hey, the cash and carry type goats, right. Okay. We'll, we'll preset some prices. And, but yeah, we have, we have people, we've had people, you know, stopping for the last two months already and, and uh, 
coming to look. We, had, I mean, we encourage everybody to swing by and look at them. If it's if they can't be their sale day or they're bidding online, I I just assume they come look at what they're bidding on and put their hands on it before they they buy it too. I guess. So. Okay. So is this something? Uh, do you and your wife is this something you intend to progress into? Being a full time career for you, leaving the other the other jobs and the other off farm income behind. Oh, it definitely been a thought process for sure. Um, you know, when this whole thing started, it was kind of a hobby and it's kind of progressed to you know a, a true business. I mean, what's good look like is obviously if we get to the point where if if my wife wants to stay home and and stay with the boys and and do this you know quote unquote full time. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd love the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, or myself someday, um, doesn't mean that either, you know, will or, or want to, but the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, definitely the end game of it, right. Is, is, Hey, we we're we're making a a good enough living at it where if we want to stay home, we can. And, and then it's our decision how hard we want to work (laughs) during the day and night, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, this has been really cool to hear about. I'm always intrigued by it. And like I said, I kind of accidentally got into the goats and it's turned out to be a real positive thing for us here on our farm. And, and it sounds like it is for you guys as well. And you have beautiful goats. Uh, the pictures are just absolutely beautiful. How can people learn more? How can people contact you? Yeah. Um, you know, we got our Facebook page, Everest Twisted Show Goats. Uh, my contacts on there. You can sure message me through the Facebook page, shoot me a call, shoot me a text. Um, you know, we're, we're up to talking, talking goats with anybody and everybody. We, uh, you know, the best part about doing this is the families we've met, the people we get to work with, um, you know, the success and the manners are, are cool, but those don't happen without the families that, that we've, you know, been lucky enough to, to sell to and, and help out, you know, since we got this thing started. So, um, that's probably the best way. And, and yeah, hopefully we can help out anybody and everybody we can. Awesome. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this with us today. Yeah, you bet, Matt. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. And thanks again to Jacob Evers for coming on and sharing that really valuable information with us. Really, really do appreciate that. And hey, we would love to have you click that subscribe button down there below. Become a subscriber here on our YouTube channel, as well as follow us on our social media outlets. You can find us there on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And everybody, until next time, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.